Okay, so this video is looking at um, analysing data using Excel. It's looking particularly at the oscilloscope task that we looked at. Um, if you were in the, the sessions in the classroom that, that, that week, um, we've brought some musical instruments in, some electrical instruments, so um, a ukulele, a mandolin and a guitar, um, and looked at plugging them into the oscilloscopes, collecting notes from them. Um, what I've got here to start with to build our tuner in Excel is um, a series of files on the bottom you can see labeled G4, F4, E4, D4 all the way through so we've got a whole octave up to C5 clearly not labeled in uh, musical order um, and what we've got in those files if I click one we've just got a time column apologies We've got a time column and we've got a voltage, so the voltage of our signal. And you can see there's a few blank cells towards the top of the B column. There was clearly a little bit of a delay on our, um, our oscilloscope when it collected the data. But these are all nice clean signals, there's no noise on them. So what we're going to do is calculate the, um, the frequency of those signals. There's a few different ways we can do that. So first way I'm looking at is the tuner file on my website. It's just called Tuner. And I'm looking at Calx2 because that's the simpler one. It's the one that you're guided through in the crib sheet. If you want to look at Calx1 and explore it on your own, you're more than welcome to. But Calx2 is the one I'm going to start with. That's the one I, that is more valuable for you to understand. Now the first two columns are purely calling through data from these other sheets that are hidden behind our calculation sheet. So what we're saying is, first of all, if there's an error, show a blank cell. Okay, just hide any errors. But then what we're saying that the main bit of the function is indirect concatenate. So put together, if I put together everything that's here, that actually says um, quotation mark apostrophe quotation mark. I'll just give me an apostrophe. Um, then I want whatever's in cell D1. Then I want another apostrophe, an exclamation mark, and an A. And then I want the row number. It might be difficult for you to imagine what that's going to look like. So if we go into formulas, we can see what that's doing when we click evaluate formula. So that's the formula I was just in. Excel underlines the, the bit it's going to calculate. So if I click evaluate, it will show me in cell D1 it says C4. The next thing it'll do is work out the row number, row 1, because I'm clicked currently in row 1. The next thing it'll do is put all of that together. So we've got quotation, uh, sorry, apostrophe C4, ex apostrophe exclamation mark A1. So it's going to do the indirect of that. It's going to say whatever is in sheet C4 cell A1 happens to be x-axis. There's no error there, so it's just going to show me x-axis. If I was to go into sheet C4, change that to hello, and go back to my calc sheet, it's changed it to hello. But if I were to look at a different sheet, C5 say, C5 still says x-axis in cell A1. So it hasn't changed. Let's change that back before I uh, I save it and forget. So these first two columns are doing exactly the same thing. The only difference is that in column A we look we've got an A in the middle of the formula because we're interested in column A, and in column B we've got a B in the middle of the formula because we're pulling column B through. So clearly we need somewhere to define our worksheet which we're interested in. So I've just said that's in cell D1. Let's take a minute to calculate these because it's got two workbooks open. So what I've done here, I've plotted column B. Column B is shown as the red line on our graph. Okay. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take all of these negative troughs where it goes below the horizontal axis and I'm going to invert them so that the, where the blue um, peaks are. So if in column C all I've done 
we squared column B and then square rooted it. So that gets rid of all my negative signs. Now I've plotted that on the uh, on the graph. Just to show you, I'll switch which order they're showing in. So you can now see that's column C, the blue, um, the blue column, the, the blue line represents column C. Okay, so we're all above the horizontal axis. The next thing it's doing is looking for zero points. So if there's a zero point, it's going to show a blank. Uh, sorry, if the time is zero, it's going to show a blank cell. If the um, value is zero, so if it's hitting the x-axis, then it's going to show the row number. Okay, well that's fairly nice to, to understand. The next bit we're looking at is saying, well, if either the row number that we're in, so I'm currently clicked in row four, if that's less than the start row, which we've said here is row four, so it isn't, or if it's bigger than the end row, I want to show zero. So I've copied this formula down miles. If I load a different data set, I don't want there to be any errors. So if it's smaller than the start or bigger than the end, I want it to show zero. If C4, so if my value that I've just squared and square rooted to get it positive, if it's bigger than E1, so bigger than a threshold value, I want to show the row number. Otherwise, I want to show the number that it said above. So what we're saying here is, only tell me rows where I go above. In this case, I've set the threshold to be 1.7. So if I annotate that on my graph, we're drawing a line across here. To imagine that's about 1.7. And any row where it goes above 1.7, it will report. Any row where it doesn't, it will say zero. Get the idea. So that's fine. <coughs> Next bit we're saying. Okay, well if F3, so if the row above is a Z, and D4 is blank, show a Z, so it must be zero. If the row above is a Z and D4 is not blank, it must be a peak, it must be coming over this threshold line. If the row above is a, P, a peak, so it's, if the row above is above the threshold, and E4 is equal to E3, so e, if they're both over the threshold, then I want it to show a P. If the row above is over the threshold, and they're not equal, then I want it to show a Z. So the first case, the first is broken down into four sections. This first section, if both values are zero, or both values are below the threshold, show a Z. This next section, if one value is below the threshold, so the row above is below, and the next value is over the threshold or equal to it, show a P. If the row above is equal to a P, so it's already over the threshold, and this value that we're looking at here is, is also over the threshold, also show a P. And finally, if the row above is a P, so it's over the threshold, and this value is not, and show a Z. Okay, there are the four combinations that you could have. And then what we've finally managed to do is we've finally said, well, okay, if either the row is less than the start or the row is bigger than the end, show zero. So that's the same thing as before. So if we put a smaller data set in, we're not getting errors thrown up. We don't go above the start value, so below the start value or above the, the final value. However, this bit's the interesting bit. So if F3 is equal to F2, so if they're both P's or they're both Z's, so if I go down a bit further so it makes more sense. So if they're both P's or they're both Z's, then show whatever was in the cell above. If they're different, then show whatever was in the cell above plus one. 
So every time we go from above the threshold to below the threshold, it adds one to the value in this column. So for instance, tracking along our graph, we go above the threshold here, it says one. Still says one, still says one, still says one. We go below the threshold, it goes up to two. Duck down, come back up. As we go over the threshold, it goes up to three. As we go over here, we go below the threshold, and it goes up, the counter goes up to four. And then it goes up to five. Okay, so what we can do, if we jump to the end of our column, oops. Too far, apologies. What we can do is we can find the maximum number of peaks, the maximum number of times it cross crosses the threshold, which we can see here is 21. So it will go over the threshold 21 times in that data set. So our time duration we can calculate. So our time duration is between the start point and the end point, And it's times by the difference in time between two rows. So that's the difference in time between two rows. That's the number of rows we're interested in, the difference between the start and the end. So that's the time duration we're interested in. We've said, OK, well, the maximum number, let's, let's assume there's, so there's a little bit of an error here, a little bit potentially of a rounding error. Um, we've said, what's the, the biggest number of times it crosses the threshold? Well, that must be 20 times. I've taken one off because I've said, OK, well, if it crosses 20 times, maybe it just crosses, maybe I'm, I've got a little bit of extra data at one end or the other. I'll take one off. So we've said 20 rather than 21. So my number of waves is then going to be the, the, um, the value we've just calculated divided by 4. I think I interrupted that mid-fly. I did. So we can then get a frequency from that by dividing our number of waves divided by the time, which will get us a frequency. The final bit, I can use a lookup. So I downloaded some tables. Um, from the internet to look up the value uh, and the, the equivalent note. So it looks up 270 and says that must be a C4. And if we look at what it was, it was a C4. If I change that to C5, different note, and you can watch the graph change, it'll recalculate everything. You can see we've got twice as many peaks now, and it said well, that must be a C5. And you've got almost double the frequency. So that's the first method of tuning, but that relies on um, nice clean data. It relies on things crossing the or, or coming close to the zero threshold. Um, and that's not necessarily always the case, particularly with um, musical instruments that are not, um, maybe they've got a battery powering them, maybe it's not a particularly clean um, electrical source. So the second method that was proposed is a little simpler in a way and harder in another. So I've just done this on one set of data for now. Um, not sure if I have other set. No, I've only got one set of data in here. So this is file tuner two. So what we've done, I've just got a set of data, but you could call it through like you did from the um, for tuner one. You could apply this in the same method, but it's um, column C. Through to, through to H, and then these top three are the, are the interesting bits. So column C is just telling me the row number. It's just a quick way of identifying the row number equals row. Okay. And I appear to have typed something there. There we go. I'm just going to close my other spreadsheet so it runs a little bit faster. So that's telling me the row number. This next column, I've said, okay, well, I want to start at row three again, because row three is where the numbers actually start. But then I want to start grouping my data. Sorry. 
So I want to go up, and I, I've defined at the top where I want to go up in fives. So I want to go from 3 to 8, from 8 to 13, 13 to 18. So I'm just adding the previous number and cell D1. If I then want to change that and go up in tens, I can change that and go up in tens. If I want to go up in twenties, I can go up in twenties. Okay. The next few columns are looking at um, separating out the different um, values. So grouping the data, if you like. So if I go up in ones, I'll just get the data again. And you can see the data is quite noisy on there. Okay, it goes it's a lot of um, extra signal that we're not interested in. <coughs> so what I can say is, okay, I um, go up in fives again, just so it's a little different. So if D3, so if the start of the group that I'm interested in is bigger than the biggest row of data in column C, then I want to show a blank cell. Okay, so that's just saying if there's no data for this group, show a blank cell. Otherwise, I want to show the maximum between B3 and B8. So what's the biggest number between B3 and B8? So that'll be the top of the group. It's interesting, I appear to have done the same thing twice there. So that's one method of looking at it and saying, okay, well, how I can then start comparing what's happening in one row to what's happening in another. Okay, but the better method, which I appear to have repeated twice, I apologise for that. Um, I suppose I've repeated it once and I've, I've done it once and then repeated it. Um, the better method would be to look at the difference between the start of the group and the end of the group. And to say what's the gradient of that group. So I've said I want to do the value in B8 minus the value in B3 all divided by the time difference for that group. So the time difference for that group is the time difference for one row times by the number of rows in the group. So you can see here whether it's going positive or negative. Okay, so that's got a positive gradient. So 3 to 8 have got a positive gradient. Data points 8 to 13 have got a negative gradient. Data points 13 to 18 have got a positive gradient again, as of 18 to 23, and then we start going down again. The next column, all I've said is, okay, well, if G3, so if, if um, the, the blue box here, so if this number is more than zero, and this one's less than zero, show a one. That'll show a zero. Then all I have to do is count the number of ones I've got I know the time that I'm measuring over, I can work out a frequency. There are ways to improve this method. That's just a very quick way of working out the gradient. So this bit here and that column, so column C, D and F, is a good way to discretize, to group your data in groups of, you know, in this case, five, but you could go up in tens. You could use the scenario manager we looked at to change that group size and see what effect it had on the frequency. Um, there are ways of improving the frequency. You can see that the frequency, depending on the group size, appears to change quite a lot. So clearly there's still some errors with this sheet. But it gives you an idea of how you might start off um, a second, a different method of using um, Excel to calculate the frequency on noisier data. Um, so that concludes that, that task. The other um, task that you might have looked at was um, using apps um, on your phone to um, record different events and then start to analyse those. Um, there won't be a video to accompany that because it depends what you recorded as to what sort of data you got out and so what sort of analysis you'd want to do. 
so that particular session if you've got any questions on that it's best to direct them to me on a one-to-one -one basis.